What's going on, everyone? It's Josh Reese. Uh, today, I'm going to do a longer episode. And I just feel like I have a lot of untold stories about my journey into optometry school and really some of the things that make me me. And so I'm going to take a little bit today and kind of do a podcasty style episode where I just talk for a while. And hopefully some of the things that inspired me to become an optometrist will also inspire you in one way or another. Um, and so I kind of just want to start with the first time that I knew something for sure about what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, it's actually kind of a sad story, but um, I grew up in Washington State, and uh, it was I grew up in Vancouver. It's really close to Portland, Oregon, and I remember my family and I went to the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, and that's kind of like a sciencey museum. I don't know. It's got like a bunch of engineering stuff in it, just like you know one of those cool museums if you've ever been to one that like these big cities have just for you to like go in and like try stuff out and learn. Uh, and so we were there and they had this exhibit called Body Works and it was like a bunch of cadavers, like people with their like skin peeled off. Like that's the vibe I got. My, everyone else loved it. But um, I remember just being so queasy when we were walking through and I just like, I didn't like throw up or anything, but I really just didn't want to be there anymore like kind of anxious about it and left. Uh, I went out to like another exhibit or something and made my dad come with me. And I remember at the end of that experience, my dad, he wasn't even looking at me or talking to me, um, but he was like in the car ride home. He said, well, at least we know Josh is not going to be a doctor. And he didn't mean it like meanly or anything like that. But kind of when he spoke those words like on to me, I was like, yeah. I'm not cut out to be a doctor. I'm not going to do that. You know, at least we know one thing for sure. I'm not going into healthcare, guys. Um, and so that was really the first time I like thought about what I was going to do when I grew up. And it was really sad that it's, it's the only thing I'm doing right now is the only thing I thought for sure I wasn't going to do. Um, this was like when I was like eight. And it stuck with me for a long, long time that I just knew I'd do anything but being a doctor um, or just like helping people healthcare in, in that regard in general. And so I remember um, I went through a ton of different things growing up because the one thing I really felt drawn to was helping people in, in a healthcare kind of way. But I would always think of different ways to go around it. Uh, I remember I wanted to be like an architect. Then I wanted to be like an author for the longest time in middle school. I wanted to be an author and uh, or like an English teacher author kind of thing. And then in high school, this was like maybe like a sophomore in high school. I remember um, having one of my friend's dads who was a field engineer is kind of like, I don't know if it's exactly that's what it's called. Um, but I remember talking to him and what he did was he was an engineer that looked at the plans of buildings and made sure they were planned to code and actually made to code and maintained to code uh, like what they're supposed to. And so he got like flown around by his work a ton. And when he wasn't being flown around, he was working from home. And I was like, dang, like, you know, using like math, I kind of like math a little bit. I was like, wow, he's using that stuff. And he's like, I don't know. They had this great life. He had a good family life. And so for like four or five years after that, I was like, field engineer. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I don't even know. I still, looking back, I didn't even know if it was called a field engineer or not. But in my mind, that's what I wanted to be. I would tell people when I grow up, I'm going to be a field engineer. Um, yeah, and it's really it was really like an identity crisis for me looking back because um, it was like running from who I really was and wanted to be inside. Um, <laughs> but I remember um, there was one time in high school where Kaiser Permanente, they came to our high school. And if you guys don't know what Kaiser Permanente is, it's like this big chain of hospitals and healthcare practices along the West Coast. And I don't know, there might be bigger than that now, but I think they sponsor the Warriors if you watch basketball. But Kaiser Permanente came to our school and they were like, hey, from this high school, 
we're going to choose, we're going to give out a scholarship, uh, the Kaiser Permanente scholarship for anyone who's going into healthcare. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm super like, I meet all the requirements for this. I like would love to do it, but it's intended to go to someone who's going into healthcare. And I was like, I can't apply for it. I'm not going to go into healthcare. I'd feel bad if I, you know, took it and just went and became a field engineer, you know? Um, and so I didn't, didn't end up applying for the scholarship at all. And, uh, I had a friend who actually ended up getting it, which was nice. Um, she really deserved it actually. She probably would have beat me out anyway, but just looking back on that story, it really did hold me back in a lot of ways, having those limits on me. I think a really big thing, um, I know I'm not a parent, but just in like people I help um, or I coach to get into optometry school, uh, just a really big thing is not having these limiting beliefs, uh, get, being very open to anything and everything, especially at the beginning, because um, you want to keep as many doors open as possible because you never know which door you'll end up choosing and you don't want to get a couple years in or, or get some significant experience in that gets you to realize what you want. And you, but the last thing you want to do is have one of those doors too far behind you where you can't open it. Um, and so fortunately in my life, I, I was able to, to go back and open that door, uh, eventually, but high school was basically high school for me. I, I did pretty good. Like <laughs> something funny about my family is my mom's a chemist. She got, uh, she graduated in her with her, um, bachelor's degree in chemistry and worked at like, I don't know, these silver processing plants and stuff like that. And so my mom is very into chemistry. And so that was like the crowning, the crowning uh, event in every one uh, of my family's life. Um, I have, I'm the youngest of six siblings. So um, there's three boys, three girls. Um, great childhood, actually. Like, it's good. I'm the, I, I already said, I'm the youngest. And so I, um, I got to see how excited my mom would get every time one of my siblings would be in a chemistry class and she got to relive her major again. Uh, she doesn't, she was a stay at home mom. And so it was, she didn't really get to do chemistry much besides um, the homework that uh, we'd bring home. And so I remember um, loving chemistry because of that, even though it's, it's the only AP class where I didn't pass the test. <laughs> but um so I got this love hate relationship with chemistry because I love it, but I'm not super good at it. Um, but yeah, so I loved chemistry, loved the sciences, loved uh, math to a lesser extent, more like the, the statistics and numbers side of math and less like, I don't know, thinking you're smart by doing all these proofs and stuff. Um, I, I didn't really get into it that much. I think it's a, a tangent. I'm, I'm on a little bit of a tangent here, but I think it's because, um, I never took a like pre-calculus or trigonometry, something like that. I just remember like I took a statistics class and um, instead of calculus. And then when I got to college, they were like, you guys should know all this stuff. And I knew none of it. Like I was taking this calculus class and all of like the first three days were supposed to be review of things we needed to know. And I'd never heard of any of it. It was like all this trigonometry stuff. And um, I remember those first three days of calculus was so bad. I ended up passing calculus my first try. Um, got a D minus on that first exam. It was, whew, that scared me because I didn't know any of that. But yeah, so I, I like numbers and math, but I, I'm not that into it. I'm more in, in the other side. Um, but I was saying that to, to show you kind of where, where my mind was. Like, I wasn't sh like set on anything, but I knew that's kind of what I liked, what the world I wanted to be in. And so um, I, after, after high school, graduated, right? Um, did pretty good. I did well in high school. Um, I went on a two, two gap years uh, to do a mission trip for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if you've ever seen those missionaries, if you're familiar with them, you know, they go two, it's usually two or three people together, like shirts and ties and the girls uh, that are missionaries wear dresses and stuff. Um, but I was spending 24 seven uh, with like, it was like the first time, like, I don't know, <laughs> not that I didn't have any friends, but I didn't hang out with a ton of people like in high school. I think 
like I it wasn't like not popular, but like I didn't hang out with people if that makes sense. Like school, I did like I didn't like go home and hang out with people. I just like hung out with people at school. But um so this was like the first time I was with someone like 24/7 and I just remember him grilling me the the first companion uh, that I was with. Um I just remember him grilling me all the time cuz he was like like I would like be like, you know, oh, turn on 21st Street. He's like, how was 21st Street back there? Like couldn't you see? I was like, no. I like <laughs> I, I, no um and like i like i don't know he was just like what does that sign say and i'd be like i don't know like i can't i don't know but uh, up until that point i was just really proud i don't know if everyone else feels this but i feel like people who don't need glasses are really proud of the fact that they don't need glasses they have like you know and i had this before this superiority complex about i'm i don't need glasses like i'm i was born like different i don't need like i don't know <laughs> it's uh real people who don't have glasses really like the fact that they don't have glasses so i was kind of like that like you know at the pediatricians when you do like the you use a cup to like cover up your eyes or something and read lines i'd always like ooh, 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 or like kind of memorize it or like squint or like i don't know cheat um i eye exam so i could like say like oh yeah i don't need glasses but I remember choking up my pride and being like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to go get glasses. This is when I was maybe 19, 20. Um, and I went to America's Best, you know, just yield America's Best by the mall. Um, it wasn't even like I didn't I didn't know about optometrists at all. Like I'd never been to one, uh, which is kind of weird. Like but just growing up, I'd never been to an optometrist. And, um, I just, my, uh, one of the other missionaries was like, Hey, like when I got glasses, this is where I went. So that's where I went. And I go into the exam, this nice lady, um, it's like white coat on and everything like did like whatever, like the 15, 20 minute exam. And I ended up getting glasses and it changed my life. And I remember walking out of there, I was like, that lady was a doctor, wasn't she? Like, that was healthcare. That was, that wasn't just like, in my mind, an eye exam was like, why do I need an eye exam? Why can't I just go out and buy glasses? But really, in that, I was like, that, you know, eye exam required someone, like a doctor, an OD, to like do an exam on me. And I walked out of there. I was like, there was no blood, there was no guts that I never thought anyone in the healthcare field could do anything without blood, without guts. And so that kind of stuck with me. It's, it didn't, you know, I still in my mind was not going to be a doctor, but I was like, maybe I'll look into that. You know, maybe I'll, I don't know. I just thought optometrists were cool after that. I was like, wow, look at that. A doctor, a doctor who doesn't do blood and guts. And, um, yeah, I had I had those glasses. They were actually don't I don't know how many pictures I posted in my era of the first few glasses that I got, but don't look up those pictures because I didn't know how to style glasses to my face. So I literally picked the cheapest ones on the shelf and said, These. I want these. And uh they're pretty darn not good looking. <laughs> so um it's funny. It's funny. But so yeah, I had those glasses changed my life. I end up going to college after my mission. Um, and this is at BYU, Brigham Young University in Utah is where I ended up going. And the first semester I had there, I took an intro to healthcare class because I still had this weird feeling that I would do something in healthcare, even though I wanted to be a field engineer and was like taking all the I don't know, general courses to go that route my first quarter or first semester of college. But I took an intro to medicine class. And I remember the first day of that class, an ophthalmologist was presenting. And he was presenting and he, you know, went through his day, like what he did, like the surgeries that they do, like, I don't know how he got and ended up getting there, like where he went to med school, all those things, like how much it was his residency. And he... Um, 
said he did a little plug for optometry he said and if you guys hate the blood and gut side of these i know there's an intro to optometry class that i think they're starting out this year and you know if if you know medicine's not for you if you still want to take care of eyes but not be a doctor you should probably look into that optometry class and i said whoa he's talking to me i was i remember sitting there with my friend and my friend he's in, he just got accepted into medical school but he was hardcore, like wanting to do that. And so he wasn't phased. But I remember sitting there in class afterwards and being like, huh, optometry. And so I switched from that class, switched out of that class the first week, you know, like the second day of classes, I switched into the preview to optometry class. And that class was like really opened my eyes. I was like, okay, it's even shorter than medical school. And like they, they don't make as like, I don't know, they make less than half of the median salary of doc, like MDs. But I was like, but that's cool. Like they were talking about optics, you know, math, using math, not every day, but like in a lot of the stuff you have to understand as an optometrist, you had to use math to understand it. And so I don't know, it was like, whoa, this is like, too good to be true, isn't it? This is too good to be true. I can't, couldn't have found this profession that is going to be a doctor with no blood and guts. Um, that I don't know, like was even like paid pretty well and everything too. It's, I don't know. I was like, wow. Cause growing up for some reason, I'd never, I never thought I'd make more than a hundred thousand dollars a year ever. Cause that was the number like rich people make this much. And then looking at the median salary of optometrist, it was like at the time, like 110 or 115. I was like, and I'd be, I'd be rich. Like what? Like I could, what? That's weird. Um, and so, yeah, I decided I want to be an optometrist in that class. And, um, it got me nice networking opportunities um, with the advisor, the pre-optometry advisor or pre-health advisor. She did like optometry, physical therapy, I don't know, other stuff too, um, podiatry. Uh, but I got, you know, connected with her and a bunch of other pre-optometry students. And I got on the email list for the pre-optometry club. And uh, one of the emails was, hey, this guy just opened a practice or not just, but like, recent recently opened practice in um down like 15 minutes away from where i was going to school in provo utah there's an optometry school in provo now actually but um it was like in spanish fork if you know utah and um i was like oh i'll apply for this job and i applied and i was talking to this doctor in the interview like i don't know how many optometrists you guys have interacted with it to this point but I remember in the interview, we talked about what my favorite band was. And at the time, I think I said something like Death Cab for Cutie, which is, you know, still like in my top five favorite bands. But he was like, oh my gosh, you know, that's one of my favorite bands, but I love Postal Service. And I, I don't know, like the, the same lead singer in both of those bands. But um, I was like, what? Like, Doctor? Chill. Like, I don't know. I just, there's so much about optometry that really hits you that you can optometrists i feel like the field of optometry lets you be a normal person a little bit more than other healthcare fields um not that you don't have to be serious and don't have to like be a practitioner and make hard decisions but it's it's a little bit more chill i feel like optometrists feel a little bit more being themselves and so that what really stuck out to me about this first doctor i worked at um I don't know, maybe I could plug him. It's Precision Vision in Spanish Fork, if you're in the area, Dr. Mendenhall. He was great. Um, but I end, didn't end up getting the job. It was an optician job, um, which is a person who adjusts the glasses and helps people purchase them and stuff like that. Um, so I applied to that job, didn't get it, but I was like, wow, that was cool. And um, I actually, so I was, I ended up getting another job um like teaching spanish and stuff like that because on my mission i learned spanish i actually served in tucson arizona so i don't know some people serve their missions in like crazy places like argentina spain i don't know somewhere else you'd learn spanish but i learned mine in tucson arizona 
So mine's more of Spanglish than other people's, but it's still good. But uh, yeah, I had a job teaching Spanish. And then I got this call from, from Dr. Mendenhall, like three months later, he was like, Hey, I just had an opening for an optician come up and you were my first alternate last time. And I just want to offer you the job instead of interviewing people. So I was like, Oh, cool. So I took, ended up taking the job, driving 15 minutes every day, uh, down to, to work. And it was really cool. Cause I, I did some teching, like pre-testing for, for, uh, patients and and um doing the optical side as well i remember looking back i thought i was good at it i really wasn't very good (laughs) at the job uh bless dr mendenhall's heart for keeping me around uh for the time that i was there but um i i learned so much about it um and actually looking back as well like um it was a newer practice i mean it wasn't like super new but it was like newer and so looking back i was like i don't know it wasn't a ton of patients like it wasn't full either but i just remember um after working there for a little bit just being like this is kind of boring it's like glasses context glasses context same thing every day every patient you know needs the same thing it's just like the patient population he had at the time i only worked for there ended up working there for like five months because I ended up getting married and we had to share one car and I didn't, we didn't have the privilege of being able to drive 15 minutes out um, every time uh, I needed to go work. And so I ended up quitting the job after five months, but after, but that job really taught me a lot of stuff I loved about optometry, but it also taught me that like the prime, not the, like, I don't know how to say it. primary care is great, but sometimes when you do primary care, um, all people's insurance that have vision insurance, the only thing they really cover is like glasses and contacts. And so there's only so much glasses and contacts you can do just like regular yield, regular glasses and contacts before it starts to become a little monotonous. And um, now in optometry school, I know that's not the case because there's so many nuances to it, but I wasn't in the exam room. I was out just doing the back end glasses and contacts. So I thought, wow, this is gonna be kind of boring. Maybe I don't wanna do optometry anymore. (laughs) So that was my big takeaway from having that optician job was, nah, no more optometry. I was still a part of the pre-optometry club because I wanted to keep my mind open, but it was at the time of, um, I was dating, uh, almost engaged um, to to my current wife. and I remember Diana saying to me, like, so where, like, what are your goals? What are you doing? Um, and stuff like that at this, like, I don't know, like getting into that stuff. And I was, I really felt so lost at this time. Like, I know, like everyone goes to their mid twenties or early twenties or whatever, even late teens where you're just like, really don't know what to do. You really don't know what you're good at. You don't like, I don't know. It really just, you feel so lost. What I've learned since then is that there's no perfect career. Just like, um, I don't know, just like there's no perfect college to go to. There's no perfect even person to date. You just have to kind of choose one, move forward with it, and find out if you can live with that or not. And so... um, And eventually, you know, after enough dating or after enough looking at colleges, after enough, I don't know, looking at careers, you'll pick one and eventually it'll feel right. And um, that's kind of how optometry was for me is I picked it, went down it and I was like, "Eh, nah. So I kept I kept my mind open. I shadowed other doc or shadowed other like professions. I um, kind of wasn't really doing the optometry prereq courses anymore. I just, um, I don't know, just my entry. I wasn't pursuing optometry as seriously as I was. Uh, but everything changed when I was asked to, well, really it was, it was a conversation with my wife and, 
And I remember her saying like, this is what I want to do. And she like lined out her, her future. And I was like, I want to be as sure of my future as she is. You know, I want to know what I, I want to do, the impact I have on the, what well, I want to have on the world. And I remember sitting down and like putting the things I can envision myself as like, if I had my perfect day, where would I be? What would I be doing? In what way would I be helping people um, ideally? And it, I thought back to the experience of me first getting glasses and thought, dang, I want to be doing that. I want to be helping people like that. And so I said, even though optometry in my mind is not great, I'm going to move forward with it. And so I got active in the pre-optometry club again. Um, I actually, a short, a short tangent on my majors. I originally was a biophysics major because um, in my mind, because I still didn't, like right when I got to school, I didn't want to be a field engineer anymore. I kind of fell out of love with that either too. Um, so I wanted to pick something that was like really, you know, prestigious at the top, you know, that would have all these prerequisites. So no matter what I did, if I pursued that major, I could still shift into other majors that I ended up wanting to do. So I was a biophysics major my first semester. And then I realized um, into the, in, a little bit into the biophysics major, I realized that biophysics freaking sucked. And it was like a four and a half year major and you had to do... <laughs> Um, you had to be taking like four core hard classes. Like think about taking physics two and OCHEM two and um, like anatomy and physiology all in the same semesters and like keep on doing that. And so it was um, like every year, you know, you had to like line them up. And so it was just getting a, a lot. And I was like, you know what? I know that to apply to any graduate school, it almost doesn't matter what major you have. And my brother was a Spanish major and I love Spanish. I took, I was taking some Spanish classes and I was like, I'll be a Spanish major because I love it. I love, uh, I don't know the language and, and the communication of it and the history of it. And so I, I was a Spanish major for a long time until this conversation with my wife. Um, and later on, or like this string, string of conversations wasn't the same conversation, but, um, I remember sitting down and, and she was like, well, when are you going to graduate? And I, she, cause she had her graduation day. I think at this point she was like a year away from graduating. And she was like, when are you going to graduate? And as a Spanish major, I wrote it all down and calculated it. And I, it was going to take me five years to graduate. Um, cause I had chosen optometry as my career was a Spanish major and to be able to do all of the Spanish major requirements, all the graduation requirements and all the pre optometry requisites, there was no overlap with any of them. And it would have taken me five, five and a half or so, like five years to graduate undergrad at the, at the course I like the, in the course I was taking. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh. Cause she was going to graduate the next year. I think this was in my second year. Like I, she was going to graduate three years before me. And I, I would like be holding her back while I went to school uh, for three years while I was just, you know, hooting and tooting around. And so I, th I thought I, you know, I'm going to look into other majors. And so the, I looked into majors that have overlap with prereqs for optometry. And I was a neuroscience major next, which was great. It took me from that five and a half years to three and a half. I was like, wow, you know, I graduate less, less in less than four years. And so I changed my major to neuroscience and was going down that. And then um, only like two weeks later, I is like still looking at majors for some reason. I maybe it just didn't feel good or something, but I found microbiology and it was so short. And those prerequisite classes for the microbiology major were like, I'm not going to say easy, but they were only like two credits when some of the ones for neuroscience were like four credits and they sounded a little easier. I don't, you know, microbiology for all you microbiologists and microbiology majors out there, it's not easy. And I know that now, but when I chose it, I was like, this is going to be an easy major. I'm, it's only going to take me three years to graduate undergrad. And, um, like. I don't know. It was, 
I was going to be out of college so much sooner than I envisioned. And I was like, woo, this is sweet. And so, um, so I was like, yeah, I'll graduate in 2021. And then I um, was in the pre-optometry club. And around this time, there's a lot of changes that happen so quickly in those couple of months. Um, but I, um, where was I going with this? The, the pre-optometry club had another job offering. And it was with a doctor who did something called vision therapy. And I decided to shadow him before I applied. And I shadowed him. And I was present, like, in that exam. It was so different than any other eye exam I'd been in with Dr. Mendenhall or the doctor, the first doctor that did me. Like, he was doing all these crazy tests. Um, and I think the first time I shadowed him, it was just a, a family came in and he did the exams on, like, three different kids uh, for that family. And I don't know, something about that exam had some magic in it where I was like, wow, that was an eye exam like that. Like that was cool. Like there was things I'd never thought of him checking different. I don't know. I couldn't even tell you what he did, but it was like binocular vision testing and that kind of stuff as well. And so I was stoked about this new vision therapy thing. And I ended up applying to work with him, getting that job. And I was working um, as a vision therapist for him for a while. Actually, I was a tech at the at the a tech at his practice and then ended up uh, being it wasn't a promotion because it's a completely different like section of the business. But I got moved to vision therapy later because I had passion for it and blah, blah, blah. But being a vision therapist really saved my soul when it came to optometry no longer was optometry like this thing where it's like eh you know i could do it um but it wouldn't be super fun and it might be boring and but i'll guess i'll do it because i need to pick something i need to go forward with something in my career and it really got this fire lit under me where i was so passionate about optometry now and i just knew it was the thing for me and like i could serve these patients in a whole nother way um, the cool thing about vision therapy is it's not like a one and done. You have patients who, um, have trouble with movements of their eyes. I don't want to get into it too much, but, and you can give them certain therapy activities to help them. Um, I don't know, have their brain and their eyes work together a little bit more and relieve some symptoms like double vision and blurry vision and, and, um, reading comprehension, that kind of thing. Um, and so it was just such a rewarding job and I loved it. And I don't know, I started to fall in love with optometry. Maybe I'll share a couple of, of experiences there just because uh, I don't know, these are some experiences that I, I like wrote in my personal statement when applying to optometry school and stuff. But maybe and I'm saying this because maybe it'll inspire one of you guys. Like if you're thinking optometry is kind of boring right now or you don't know like what to do. Um. But there was a one patient I remember. So for some reason, in Provo, Utah, there's this concussion clinic called CFX that gained some notoriety for some reason. Like, I don't know the reasons behind it. Gained some notoriety in the Netherlands. And so there's, people would fly in from the Netherlands to come to this concussion clinic. And that concussion clinic was just like right across from our vision therapy clinic and vision therapy is very helpful for some patients with post concussion syndrome and, and like after like a traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury. And so we'd get referrals from this concussion clinic. And so this lady was, um, from, uh, the Netherlands and we were doing vision therapy on her and she had multiple diagnoses for binocular vision stuff. Like, she couldn't point her eyes. Everything was like double. She couldn't focus them. Everything was so blurry. And she really couldn't like track her eyes together and read. And so she just, you know, had everything wrong um, with her eye binocular vision stuff. And as we went through the sessions together, she was only in town for like two weeks. So she was trying to like do as many therapy sessions as she could in those two weeks. Um, but I was... 
working with her and she I don't know I don't want to cry <laughs> but um when a patient who is a brain injury patient has been looking for relief for so long sometimes they think they're crazy because the research hasn't caught up to a lot of concussion treatment yet um now they're making a lot of advancements in the last couple of years but some like neurologists and other specialists you see out there have so many different methodologies for treating certain things. And sometimes they just say, yeah, oh, we can't help you, you know? And so this patient was at the end of like a five year journey of trying to get better. And vision therapy just happened to be her last, the last straw. And she would like break down crying because she's like, I didn't have a headache today. And like, I don't know. She just, her personality, like when someone who's gone through something like that has wins and they start like getting their life back, their personality completely changes. And so she went from this like sealed off, um, kind of like angry person to such a happy, such a cheerful person. Um, her whole demeanor just changed and it was so cool to just see it and her be so grateful for the, the stuff we were doing. Um, at our clinics and I don't know ah, man and then another one um, a lot of pediatric patients so kids with um, trouble in school sometimes uh, their learning issues aren't aren't necessarily coming from like a learning disability but more like they just haven't throughout their like development childhood haven't developed these binocular vision skills that you need to like do something hard like read and do work up close and stuff like that and so there was this um, family who had just come from Mexico and the daughter struggled with convergence and sufficiency. Uh, it's the most, most common one that maybe you've heard of. Um, but she had a really hard time reading and in school and everything. And I did the sessions in Spanish um, and the family was there so they could understand too. But again, as a kid, you know, like how frustrated you get when you didn't understand homework. And like, maybe you had those experiences where your dad's like sitting next to you, your mom trying to get you to do your homework. And it's like, no, what's two plus two. And you just don't know. And they're like, I don't know why it's so hard, but it is. And so like, she was a very like behavioral problems kind of person. Um, you know, hard to, hard to get to stand still or care. And she, became this all-star like I don't know she like would start reading for fun like I don't know these the changes that happen in some of these kids or some of these patients like you know that changes your life when you start to like like reading because you can focus on in on the book and it doesn't go blurry or double or swim on the page at all and you can just like read like, I don't know, it, it really, it really changes these people's lives. Uh, enough about those, but it, yeah, you know, I don't know. If you haven't shadowed a vision therapy doctor or know a lot about vision therapy, I would definitely look at, um, well, even vision therapy at like some of the colleges of optometry is a little bit different. I would go shadow some private practice vision therapy doctors. Um, not all of them are, you know, the best. Of course, you got to find like good one. I know the doctor I worked for. Oh, I could plug him too. It's Dr. Duval at New Sight Vision Therapy in Provo. But um, I don't know, like go, go look into vision therapy and, and see um, maybe some of the, the stories of the patients who have been touched by vision therapy because, because it really does change lives just, just as impactful or even more in my, in my opinion, you know than um than doing glasses and contacts coming back to to uh the fire that i had now for that was burning for optometry um it started to be crazy because i realized if i was going to graduate in just a year because i was in my second year um if i was going to graduate in a year I'd want to go into optometry school the next year and to go into optometry school the next year, you'd have to, 
um, to go into optometry school the next year, I'd have to have already taken the optometry admissions test, applied to schools, gotten accepted to schools, you know, interview, and like, I'd have to do all this process in the next year. And this is about May or yeah, April, May of 2020. And I was going to need to be going, you know, a year from then almost, you know, in August of 2021, enter optometry school. And so I, I, I was like last minute realizing my timeline. And so that summer, it was a COVID summer. So I um, was taking classes online and then I studied for the OAT uh, a couple hours a day. And um, I, I don't know, this is just it was so quick. So I re was researching all these schools. At this time I was the optometry, uh, pre-optometry, the pre-optometry club president. And um, like, so I had all these connections to the schools, which was nice. And so I was reaching out to all these schools uh, asking them questions and researching and I took the OAT in July. I was going to take it earlier, um, but the testing centers were closed down for COVID and they opened in July. And so I ended up taking it in July. Um, I did ended up doing pretty well on it and I um, got into optometry school. Um, I actually, I don't know, I tell... I tell a lot of these stories like about applying and and um, getting in some of my experiences in optometry school. I talk about those more often on my channel, but uh, so I won't go too many details in now, but it was just cool how how welcoming the career was, even though I wasn't like this long term track, even if it was something that felt a little last minute, um, I was still belonged you know i still felt like i belonged and now i'm here at the arizona college of optometry go like i'm in my third year now i'm already seeing patients you know making these diagnoses and treating people and gosh it's been so rewarding and you know i thought glasses and contacts was boring i haven't had a normal glasses and contacts patient in, in clinic so far 10 patients and i've had macular degeneration retinal holes uh retinal pseudo holes uh, dry eye disease, cataracts, like everything but glasses and contacts. And so, I don't know, optometry really is so rewarding. And uh, if you haven't found your passion for it, or maybe you've lost your passion for it, I would really recommend getting in, getting down and dirty um, with with some of the uh, some of the day to days. I I really recommend just taking a Saturday uh, or even like. A day where you have half the day free and shadowing some of these doctors. Uh, that's it's precisely the reason why optometry schools require shadowing hours before applying, is because as you shadow, you'll you'll see how it is and develop the passion for it. And so, um, even if you're in optometry school right now, take some time to shadow uh, some of the practices that you can envision yourself working at, because. Not only is it like good networking and stuff, but it will really put things back in perspective because there's so much to optometry there. You know, you can do anything from primary care, glasses, contacts to disease. Well, not just disease, posterior segment disease, anterior segment disease, specialty uh, contacts, um, you know, vision therapy. Um, you can even do the neuro optometry side of it. You can do uh, the low vision exams. You can do electrodiagnostics. You can work for industry. Big companies like Essilor Luxottica, Johnson & Johnson, or even like normal companies like Meta, um, or, you know, like, I don't know, these tech companies that work on products for the eyes, like VR and stuff, they hire optometrists. And so you... You can, optometrists are everywhere. You, you can even work in academia. You can be like, if you, I don't know, you can be a professor at an optometry school and not see too many patients, but still, still so much you can do with optometry. And it's really 
Uh, anyone who has eyes benefits from having an optometrist. Yeah. The last thing I wanted to hit on too uh, was something I didn't realize um, until until I was starting this YouTube channel. So the the reason I started YouTube uh, is during COVID. We ended up getting a dog. What's up, Kiwi? <laughs> um, and I would take her like take her out to go potty like three times a day, and each time it would take like ten minutes, and that was like half hour of my time gone every day. And I just, I don't know, in COVID, you know, things are different. And I was like, wait, I felt like I was wasting my time. And I was watching a lot of YouTube and realizing I wanted to consume optometry content, but there wasn't enough optometry content out there to consume. So, you know, I don't know if you're on pre-optometry YouTube, you got Khan, right? She's already out of optometry school. She's in her residency right now. Actually, oh. And in July, she's she's past her residency now. Um, and other people who, you know, are far removed from from optometry. And so, um, but there's only like a handful, maybe like four, five, six, who had some consistent content that you could actually watch. Um, you know, he, there's other videos here and there. But um, I thought gosh, there needs to be more optometry content out there. And I had just taken the OAT like the week before. And so I remember that one of the first videos was just walking Kiwi. And I said, I'm instead of wasting time, I'm going to record a video walking Kiwi. And I just started recording. I just, I'm so dumb. Like I remember um, in high school, my friends and I would like be making fun of YouTubers and we'd go like, what's up YouTube? And so uh, just to be ironic and funny, I do that at the beginning of all my videos for the first little bit. So, I mean, I don't forbid you from going back and watching those, but I'm a lot more proud of the videos now than I am back then. I'm sure I'll look back on this video and think it's cringy too. But um, it felt really nice to put content out there and, and see that I was meeting a need. Seeing people be like, oh, whew, finally, someone who's going through these experiences um, and making content that, that I need. And so if you're listening to this right now and you're pre-optometry or even optometry, put more content out there. We don't have enough optometry content out there. Not even like for me, I still watch all the videos, um, that other people in optometry post, you know, follow all of them on Instagram and TikTok and all those content creators that are optometrists. And I don't know, something like a Instagram, we have like an okay amount of optometrists in Instagram, but create content you know go go out there make a video about what you know i know your perspective can help someone else and you know i'm never going to get like super famous in this because optometry is like a niche thing but i'm not here to get famous i'm here to help people and um even if it's there's only a couple people who are going to listen to this video it's still going to help a couple people and and those people matter <laughs> but the reason I got, got down to about making content in the first place is I realized that I, I wasn't gonna, I don't know, kind of how I talked about there's no perfect career. I didn't, I realized I didn't want to be an optometrist as the only thing that I wanted to do. Um, I actually had this TikTok that I made kind of pop off about when you're almost a doctor, but you realize you don't want to be a doctor anymore. Um, which people were like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Like people would see me afterwards and be like, are you okay? And I'd be like, yes. But, but my, my thing with that is the more I make content, the more I realize that I don't just want to, um, be a doctor. I also want to be an entrepreneur. I want to like help people. Um, which I don't know. Entrepreneur is like this loaded word, but basically I want to be able to bring my ideas to life and have them help people. And uh, there we go. Optometry. Like, like how I said closer to the beginning, like there's no way it can be this perfect job for me. And it really is because optometrists have private practices and those private practices are businesses. And so you can be an entrepreneur and a doctor and like if you're into style and fashion and like that kind of retail stuff you can be that as well 
Uh, if you're into just the medical, like wanting to work in a hospital kind of things, you can work in a hospital. Like, I don't know, optometry really, it's it. And so as I've been making content about optometry, I've been falling more in love with optometry and um, getting more connected with the optometry community out there. And so, um, I mean, those are all the thoughts that I wanted to to put into this video. But I just want just want um, to like make the impression on on whoever's listening to this um, that you matter, and you like I don't know optometry doesn't define you, but it does give you the opportunities to become a very stunning and a very well-rounded person. You know, optometry has provided me with so many opportunities. The more conferences I go to, the more I learn in school, the more I'm with patients, the more I just am in awe at the impact I'm having, um, the time I get to spend with people and make a difference in their life, and just how much fun and interaction it is. And I don't know. It's a perfect blend of like people skills, math, patient care, um, entrepreneurship. I don't know. Optom you know, this is like an open letter, an open love letter to optometry. And, and that's so <laughs> this is my long personal statement, right? This is like if I could make my personal statement into optometry school, a 50 minute video, this is it. So thank you guys for, for listening here. Um, my one, my one request um, at the end of this video for you guys is to, uh, yeah, I'm going to say it, you know, smash the like button, subscribe if you can, and share this video with someone who, who you might think needs it because the optometry community is underserved and I hope this video can help um, a couple more people and you can be the one to help, help that person by sharing this with them. So thank you for watching and I don't know, maybe well, there's more podcast style content coming out soon. So we'll see it. Bye.